We're exploring the strange underground world of bare knuckle fighting, plus a deal that more than doubles the earnings of some Las Vegas Aces players is being investigated by the WNBA, Fanatics is suing Marvin Harrison Jr., and someone paid almost a million dollars for a napkin. It's Monday, May 20th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. If a company offers the same deal to every player on a team, does that constitute a deal with the team itself? That is more than a philosophical question for the WNBA and the Las Vegas Aces. The Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority offered a $100,000 annual sponsorship deal for this year and next to each player on the Aces who are going for a three-peat this season. That deal more than doubles the earnings of some players and provides a 50% boost to the $200,000 salaries of top players Aja Wilson and Kelsey Plum. However, the deal is being investigated by the WNBA. Players, of course, are allowed to have sponsorship deals. However, teams are not allowed to provide certain benefits, and the league is looking into whether this deal effectively constitutes a salary increase for Aces players. The WNBA has shown its willingness to enforce its rules on impermissible benefits. It fined the New York Liberty $500,000 for providing charter flights in the second half of the 2021 season. Now, of course, the league itself is providing charter flights for every team. Last year, the league took away the Aces' first-round draft pick in 2025 after finding that the team promised players impermissible benefits. The WNBA has its reasons here. It doesn't want different teams offering radically different pay and quality of life, but a big part of growing the league is providing those things to its players, and with a new CBA coming up, they won't be able to hold this off forever. Marvin Harrison Jr. has not played an NFL game yet, but he's already involved in one of the more complex contract disputes in the league. The Cardinals wide receiver is being sued by Fanatics for not following through on a contract. According to ESPN, the deal is for at least $1 million and includes signed trading cards, game-worn apparel, and other marketing opportunities. However, the official HarrisonCollection.com claims it is, quote, the only website to purchase signed Harrison memorabilia. The official Harrison Collection LLC is also named as a defendant in the Fanatics lawsuit. Fanatics claims that it has already paid Harrison, who has not fulfilled his obligations. They also say he told ESPN confidential parts of his contract. All of this stuff is normally mediated through an agent, but Harrison doesn't have one. His father, Marvin Harrison Sr., seems to be his primary advisor here. We have yet to hear their side of the story regarding the lawsuit. And finally, someone paid nearly $1 million for a messy napkin. Specifically, it's the napkin on which the contract terms were written, committing a then 13-year-old Lionel Messi to Barcelona on December 14, 2000. The napkin was signed by agents Horacio Gaglioli, Josep Maria Minguela, and Barca's sporting director at the time, Carles Resach. The three of them were at a tennis club in Barcelona, and Resach asked the waiter for a piece of paper and instead was given a napkin. The price on the napkin was £300,000, or $380,000 by today's exchange rate. Now, between his on-field and off-field earnings, Messi makes roughly that amount every day. Next, bare knuckle fighting is starting to come out of the shadows, with sanctioned fights being broadcast live, and Conor McGregor joining the bare knuckle fighting championship as a part owner. But for years, it was an illegal world largely funded by organized crime. My next guest, author Staten Bonner, embedded himself in that world, getting to know it through the eyes of its champion, Bobby Gunn. And it's a strange, fascinating, and increasingly popular realm of sports, and one that you'll hear my ambivalence about in this conversation. And that is coming up next. I'm joined now by Staten Bonner, former editor at Rolling Stone and author of the upcoming book, Bare Knuckle, Bobby Gunn, 73 and 0, A Dad, A Dream, A Fight Like You've Never Seen. Welcome, Staten. Thanks for having me on. Thrilled to be here. Yeah, great to have you on. Uh, you wrote an article a couple of years ago for Men's Journal, and then this book coming up on, out on April 23rd about bare knuckle boxing and the former champion of that sport, Bobby Gunn. This is like a strange, seedy, underground world. How did you come across this whole bare knuckle community, if we can call it that, in the first place? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I was not a fight fan, didn't know anything about it. Uh, I was working at GQ magazine in New York in 2012, and I saw a small blurb on ESPN about the first bare knuckle fight held in the United States in over 100 years on tribal land in Arizona. Uh, at the time, I was reading a book called The Sweet Science by A.J. Liebling, a famous writer for The New Yorker in the early 20th century. And it detailed the early days of boxing in New York City, uh, which was fascinating. It was a huge sport there and across the country, much bigger than it is today. And it had a section on bare knuckle fighting, the history of that, which I knew nothing about, which used to be the top sport in America alongside horse racing and baseball in the yeah. 1800s. So um, I, I basically saw that blurb on ESPN. I looked up the fighter who had won. His name was Bobby Gunn. 
He was training across the river in Hackensack, New Jersey. I was just curious, reached out to him on Facebook. He said, why don't you come see me train? I went into a gym in this Polish neighborhood over there, went into a back room, and there was a guy with a World War I gas mask on, uh, shadow boxing in a ring. I was like, who is this guy? He came over, took it off. And it was Bobby Gunn. That was, that was kind of uh, training at altitude for him, requiring to breathe harder. And that was one of I his see. unique training aspects. And he just brought me into this world. I uh, started following him to fights around the city, around the Northeast. And um, it was just a fascinating story. And it moved from there. And was having him along was like sort of being his plus one did that give you enough of an in to this whole world where people could say like, okay, he's with Bobby. We're not going to mess with him. Or did you have to, I mean, there's like, you know, the whole thing's illegal and also the organized crime is involved. Did you have to go further to earn the trust of that whole world? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my wife at one point was like, what are you doing? This is crazy. Yeah. But what was interesting to me was Bobby uh, was a father to a seven year old daughter and he was, Using the money he was making in these underground fights, which could vary from a few grand up to fifty thousand uh, dollars, to put her through uh, private school. So he was very sweet. He was also very religious, um, and you know, I, I, he was just very interesting to me. But to answer your question, yes, I was vetted, approved by Bobby. Uh, when I first my first fight, uh, when I met him uh, at another city, he showed up. I, I came to an, a disclosed uh, undisclosed location. I was told to not say anything. Uh, Bobby Gunn was there. He had a bat over his shoulder, said he took it for security. I also met David Feldman, now the founder of Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship, the fastest growing combat sport in the world. He told me not to breathe a word about it or it'd be my last story. So I, I was never, if you read the book Bare Knuckle, I don't disclose locations. I don't go into details on the organized crime syndicates that were backing these. Uh, but, you know, these 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 were people who were, like any other um, subculture, they were uh, happy to share their story, honestly. And I treated them with respect and understanding what they were doing and also discretion. Uh, there's a lot of aliases and vague locations yeah. in my book. Yeah. And I want to get in further into that world for a moment. But let's let's uh, linger for a moment on, on Bobby Gunn himself. So he, another thing that I just had no idea existed uh, from until I, I read your work, uh, he is part of this nomadic group of Irish um, Irish people called the Travelers, uh, who are very religious, who have a long fighting tradition. Uh, yeah, just tell us a bit about the Travelers. Yeah, so the Irish Travelers, as you would imagine, are mostly uh, in Ireland, in the UK. However, there are a group here in the United States. If you saw the Guy Ritchie film Snatch, uh, the character played by Brad Pitt as a bare knuckle fighter. And he was an Irish traveler uh, living in a caravan in that film. So those people, uh, that subculture lives here in the United States. I didn't, again, didn't know anything about them. Uh, they typically go to school for a little while and then drop out. Uh, they don't really work corporate jobs. They literally have their own language. Uh, they speak with each other and they're usually itinerant workers uh, often in media, they are portrayed as scam artists. Uh, but when I delve deeper in that and specifically talked with a priest in Memphis who works with them, they're scattered throughout the country. I learned that's not the full story. And, and Bobby himself grew up in this community. And they, they really do. They prize religion. Uh, they grew up very faithful. Bobby would lie prostrate before every fight. Uh, when I was interviewing him, you know, no drinking, anything like that. No tattoos. Uh, but they also grew up fighting. I mean, that was their, you know, typically it's an impoverished community uh, for many, in many ways. Um, and there's the, the fight community uh, within that world uh, is a way to gain respect. Actually, Tyson Fury, a uh, global uh, champion in, in the boxing world, is also an Irish traveler, also friends with Bobby Gunn. Uh, I've actually spoken with Tyson Fury through Bobby. So it, it is a culture um, that I did not know about. But Bobby came up in that world fighting, and uh, that really informed his bare knuckle and also boxing career. And what's the why do they have a reputation as scam artists? I mean, is that just nonsense, or or is is there you know something to pull on there? 
No, there's definitely some truth to that. Uh, there are, I mean, as with any people, uh, there are certain people who, uh, you know, will, will pull scams uh, for paving, for instance. They might say they're going to pave your driveway and then do a really shoddy job, overcharge you. Sometimes they do target elderly communities. If you Google the Irish travelers, you will see an, a litany of these things. But those are the really the examples that get the most press. What you don't find uh, when I delved into it are the people like Bobby, who are just hardworking, everyday people. Uh, he has two kids trying to support them at, at the time I was profiling him. Um, so, yeah, there is truth to that aspect, but it's not the whole story. And, yeah, on on Bobby and on the money side, one thing I found very striking in the book was that um, some of these fights, when there's a lot of money involved, he's taking home a good amount of money. But at the same time, he is scraping by uh, to yeah, make his kids' tuition payments and you know, you know, support his family. So, yeah, how much how much are these fighters making? How much money is involved generally? Where is it all gambling based? Give us a sense of the money flow here. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I think what's interesting and to keep in mind is Bobby was a pro boxer for years, uh, basically until the age of 30 when he left pro boxing. He was fighting under Carl King, Don King's son, Las Vegas, around the world, um, and, and then came back into pro boxing later in life. What was appealing to him and other fighters, what was interesting, a lot of the people who compete in underground matches are pro boxers, are pro MMA guys, um, and they're used to getting screwed over. Uh, in paperwork, in uh, legitimate fights, um, you know, and, and getting promoters take a long time to pay off after a bout. So what was appealing to them was the quick money aspect of bare knuckle. That said, I mean, this comes, this is not a, a regular day job, right? So yeah. bare knuckle fights come here and there. They can vary probably from a few hundred bucks uh, to up to, you know, $50,000. Uh, some of the Russian mob fights um, Bobby was fighting in, in outer Brooklyn. Uh, that said, the, the way it works, it, it's interesting if you look in the history of bare knuckle fights, to, back to John L. Sullivan, who was the LeBron of his day, bare knuckle champion in the United States, made headlines worldwide as this idea of a side bet. So each camp stakes money for about, say, $10,000. Uh, so you have to put a portion of that up front. Uh, in addition, there are side bets that are made on the day of. And Bobby doesn't have $10,000 a lot of times. But a lot of these fighters, he's backed by the Irish mob. So the Irish mob came to him after a fight, said, we like the way you roll. And it's a blood sport. So it's like a, a lot of these mob factions will have gatherings and different, uh, you know, different groups will put up their fighters against the others. And it's, it's kind of an event like that. So Bobby would be staked in a lot of times uh, by the Irish mob. You know, Hell's Kitchen, they would do fights uh, throughout the Northeast. Um, in addition, Bobby would have a, a group of his peers who would chip in money and, and put in to stake him. And uh, there was one promoter I talked to at these underground venues. He would literally call, take what he calls a cage, which is a portable metal safe with holes in a lining. And he'd screw it into the ground, put the money in there uh, from both camps. And then at the end, they would divvy it up. And it's funny. It's, it is, it's a very old system. Uh, but, you know, he had the point of, you know, it's not as easy to rob these places as you think. You, you know, you're not going to stick up 100 guys. Uh, so so basically there would be stake money involved. And a lot of that could come from uh, the mob faction and they would take that. And Bobby could receive a portion of that, but probably his main income was also in side bets. Um, and and th that's a historic part of, of the sport. So, yeah, when you say a $50,000 fight that is coming, that that's mostly being put up by these organized crime groups who are each, you know, bringing out their guy and, and, and they take that haul and then the fighter gets some, and that's, that's how it works basically. Yeah. The fight, the mob, that's how it works. Sometimes like the mob will, that would be their stake. In addition to that, Bobby might've put up a portion of that, that he had scraped together uh, from other people and he would put up that his own side money and he would win that on the side. So yeah, it would typically be a mix of staking from a uh, organized crime unit that had the cash, in addition to Bobby having his own side bet on some of those larger bouts. But there was a ton of smaller ones he would do, you know, five grand, 10 grand. 
where he would just put up that money himself. Again, that's typically from a group of peers. I talked to, um, you know, one friend, another traveler. He'd get a call from Bobby. He'd be in North Dakota working on an oil fracking unit and said, you know, I need two grand. Can you spot me? And he said he always did, and he never lost money. Uh, so he would get paid back, and then Bobby would reap the benefit as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, fascinating. And so it, all of the money is coming from from betting, essentially. I mean, like maybe you know people are, are paying a few bucks to to watch, or is there any significant non betting part of this? No, it's pretty much all betting. I mean, this is similar to um, again cockfighting, uh, human dog fighting. Uh, you know, this is still a brutal subculture that exists in some communities uh, throughout the country. And yeah, it's, it's mostly run on betting. I mean, yeah, maybe some venues you might have a slight kind of cover charge to get in, but the, the real money is involved in the betting. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, I mean, on that brutality piece, there were times when I was reading when I, I felt physically uncomfortable. Um, at the same time, you know, you, you draw comparisons to boxing and MMA and, you know, those there's serious injuries and, and the points you make the case or, you know, people in the book make the case of, you know, this is actually safer because um, you're, you're, you have to hit softer to protect your own hands and um, it's more surface wounds. It looks bloodier, um, but internally um, there at least maybe some debate over um, whether this or boxing is safer. Um yeah, anyway, I, I'm just wondering, kind of having spent some time in this world, how how you view the, you know, the bloodiness and brutality of it all? Yeah, it's a brutal sport. There's no question about it. Um, you know, it's very binary in, in my experience. And David Feldman would tell me the same thing. You get an immediate reaction. People either love it or they hate it. Um, the In terms of the safety aspect, that was surprising and interesting to me. Um, yes, it's bloodier than boxing. Uh, bare knuckle skin on skin um, immediately creates cuts, immediately creates superficial wounds. However, fighters punch with less velocity. If you don't have a glove on your hand, um, then you're much more likely to break a bone in your hand. So you naturally self-regulate and don't punch the other person as hard. A great comparison is rugby versus NFL football, right? So NFL football, looks much it's much more palpable to watch on a sunday afternoon you just see people kind of banging into each other but those guys are hitting each other with extreme velocity that uh, reverberates throughout their brains and results in cte in a lot of cases uh with rugby it's bloody uh but again they're not hitting each other as hard and um it's the same thing with bare knuckle well, a recent study came out that did show uh, it's, it's it's not conclusive yet it's early, but less less cases of CTE is a result of, of um, bare knuckle fighting. You know, less concussions, fewer concussions. So it makes sense on that aspect, uh, but it's still a very brutal, bloody sport, no doubt. And you mentioned some of the efforts to legalize this and make it uh, a more legitimate sport that you know maybe we would watch on on ESPN or at least a pay per view channel. Um, where, where, where do those efforts stand right now? Well, fascinatingly, when I was profiling, you know, Bobby Gunn and David Feldman in the article and what became the book, that was 2012 uh, through 2018, um, they were putting on fights in back alleys and auto body garages, basically being chased by boxing commissioners and, and authorities um, and putting on illegal fights. Uh, what was fascinating was David Feldman in 2018 managed to convince the state of Wyoming to actually sanction and host uh, the first bare knuckle, legal bare knuckle bout in a state outside of tribal land in the United States. Um, and I went to that event. It was, um, uh, you know, well attended, professionally run. That speaks to David Feldman, uh, his background. He was a boxer, came up in Philadelphia, son of a legendary fight trainer, uh, you know, came up boxing and then was putting on these boxing MMA promotions, uh, you know, in kind of dead end spots, casinos along the Mississippi River, uh, you know, tribal lands out in the southwest. And he put Bobby on a card for as a boxing event in Arizona and Bobby introduced him to the bare knuckle world. 
and David had an entrepreneurial entrepreneurial spirit, saw it as a potential to create a new type of fight sport. And he went all in. So he finally got Wyoming to agree to put this event on. I was there. It's chronicled in my book, Bare Knuckle. Uh, it was a success. It was actually Bobby's last fight. Um, and it's gone on from there to uh, a, like it falling like a series of dominoes. He's, uh, you know, had the sport sanctioned in state after state after state across across the country and recently put on their first bout in Las Vegas as well as across the world. So now Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship is a multi-million dollar business run by David Feldman, the same guy I was profiling, who was doing this in uh, back alleys as illegal matches uh, 10 years ago. So it's it's pretty pretty fascinating to see its growth. And it, it, as this becomes legitimate, and you know, and maybe hypothetically, if if you know the, the cover is torn off, and you can say, all right, you can come out now. What kind of um, how how big is this right now? Like, like what 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 kind of world would, would we be looking at um, if if we could see it all? Um, do you mean bare knuckle fighting championship, or do you mean this, the illegal underground yes. bare knuckle bouts? I guess kind of both, like the sport in general. Um, how how much is this going on? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so when I was writing this book and profiling different folks, I mean, I, I talked to fighters in Florida, in New York, in Texas. Uh, guys would go across the border into Mexico and fight in bull rings in small towns as part of a series of bouts. Uh, you know, I met a Marine who was introduced to the sport at an underground event in San Diego when he was there in basic training. So to answer your question, the sport is, is everywhere. I mean, I've talked to fighters who have also traveled to Russia and different countries to fight in bouts overseas. Uh, that's the illegal underground aspect, and that's obviously unregulated, and that's really fueled by gambling. So it's shadowy. I think it um, at the time when I wrote, when I interviewed Gunn, uh, you know, there was a landline phone in a gym in Patterson, New Jersey, uh, Ike and Randy's gym, where, uh, you know, underground types knew to call him and leave a message, and he would call back and, and you know, set up a fight and travel wherever. Uh, these days, um, there are still underground events that happen for sure. Uh, but I think the rise of bare knuckle fighting championship is an actual legitimate sport. And the fastest, you know, growing combat sport currently is, um, you know, speaks speaks to the growth at a, at a le legal level. Um, so I think I think probably it'll be interesting to see how this develops. It, it could be a situation where you know, fighters come up doing boxing, uh, they come up doing MMA, and perhaps now they really do focus more on underground bare knuckle fights as a conduit to, uh, you know, a bare knuckle uh, championship uh, legal fight. Um, it'll be interesting to see, but the, 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 the rise of bare knuckle fighting championship is a legal sport. I'm not sure what that's going to do to the underground, but I, I'm sure the underground will, will always continue to exist in some form or fashion. Bare Knuckle, Bobby Gunn, 73 and 0, a dad, a dream, a fight like you've never seen, comes out on April 23rd. State and Bonner, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Owen. Thanks for having me. That's it for today. Drop us a rating and review wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.